Greetings, today I will be reading a story by Anton Chekhov. He was a Russian playwright and a short story writer who is considered to be among the greatest writers of short fiction in history. His career as a playwright produced four classics and his best short stories are held in high esteem by writers and critics. The story which I decided to read today is uh, titled Vanka. Vanka is one of Chekhov's many stories with a child family separation team based on his own experience, supported himself through school and sending money to the rest of his family in Moscow. It was published Christmas Day, 1886, and here's how it goes. Vanka Zhukov, a boy of nine who had been for three months apprentices to Alakhin the shoemaker, was sitting up on Christmas Eve, waiting till his masters and mistress and their worksmen had gone to the midnight surface, he took out his master's cupboard, a bottle of ink and a pen with a rusty nip and spreading out a crumbled sheet of paper in front of him, began writing. Before forming the first letter, he several times looked round fearfully at the door and the windows, st stole a glance at the dark icon, on both sides of which stretched shelves full of lasts and heaved a broken sigh. The paper lay on the bench while he knelt before it. Dear Grandfather, Konstantin Makarich, he wrote, I am writing you a letter. I wish you a happy Christmas and all blessings from God Almighty. I have neither father nor mother. You are the only one left me. Vanka raised his eyes to the dark icon on which the light of his sandal was reflected and vividly recalled his grandfather Konstantin Makarich, who was right night watchman to a family called Zhivarev. He was a thin but extraordinarily nimble and lively little old man of 65 with an everlastingly laughing face and drunken eyes. By the day he slept in the servant's kitchen or made jokes with the cooks, at night wrapped in an ample sheepskin, he walked round the grounds and, taped with his, and tapped with his little mallet. Old Kashtanka in eel, so-called an accountant of his dark color, and his long body like a weasel's followed him with hanging heads. This eel was exceptionally polite and affectionate and looked with equal kindness on strangers and his own masters, but had not very good reputation. Under his politeness and meekness was a hidden, was hidden the most Jesuitical cunning. No one knew better how to creep up on an occasion and snap at one's legs to slip in the storeroom or steal a hen from the peasant. His hind legs had been nearly pulled off more than once, twice he had been hanged, every week he was trashed till he was half dead, but he always revived. At this moment, Grandfather was, no doubt, standing at the gate, screwing up his eyes at the red windows of the church, stamping with his high felt boots and joking with the servants. His little mallet was hanging on his belt. He was clasping his hands, shrugging with the coat, and, with an aged chuckle, pinching first the housemaid, then the cook. How about a pinch of snuff, he was saying, offering the woman his snuff box. The woman would take a sniff and sneeze. Grandfather should be would be indescribably delighted, go off in a merry chuckle and cry. Tear it off, it has frozen on. They give the dogs a sniff of snuff too. Kashtanka sneezes, wriggles her head and walks away offended. Eel does not sneeze from politeness but wags his tail. And the weather is glorious. The air is still fresh and transparent. The night is dark but one can see the whole village with its white roofs and coils of smoke coming from the chimneys. The trees silvered with hoar frost the snow drifts. The whole sky spangled with gay twinkling stars and the Milky Way is as distinct as through it had been washed and rubbed with snow for a holiday. Vanka sighed, dipped his pen and went on writing. And yesterday I had a wigging. The master pulled me out of the yard by my hair and whacked me with a boot stretcher because I accidentally fell asleep while I was rooking their brat in the cradle. And a week ago, the mistress told me to clean the herring, and I began from the tail end, and she, shook, and she took the herring and thrust its head in my face. The worksman laughed at me and sent me to the tavern for vodka and told me to steal the master's cucumbers for them. And the master beats me with anything that comes to hand. And there is nothing to eat. In the morning they give me bread for dinner porridge, and in the evening bread again. But as for tea or soup, the master and mistress gobble it all up themselves. And I am put to sleep in the passage, and when their wretched brat cries, I get no sleep at all, but I have to rock the cradle. Dear Grandfather, show me the divine mercy. Take me away from here, home to the village. It's more than I can bear. I bow down to your feet and will pray to God for you forever. 
take me away from here or I shall die. Vanka's mouth worked, he rubbed his eyes with his black fist and gave a sob. I will powder your snuff for you, he went on. I will pray for you and if I do anything you can thrash me like Cyrus goat. And if you think I have no job, then I will beg the steward for Christ's sake to let me clean his boost, boosts or I will go for a shepherd boy instead of Fetka. Dear grandfather, it is more than I can bear. It's simply no life at all. I wanted to run away from the village, but I have no boots and I am afraid of the frost. When I grow up big, I will take care of you for this and not let anyone annoy you. And when you die, I will pray for the rest of your soul, just as for mommies. Moscow is a big town. It's all gentlemen's houses and there are lots of horses, but there's, there are no sheep and the dogs are not spiteful. The lads here don't go out with the star and they don't let anyone go into the choir. And once I saw a shop window fishing hooks for sale, fitted ready with the line and all sorts of fish, awfully good ones. There, there was even one hook that would hold a 40 pound sheet fish. And I have seen shops where there are guns of all sorts after the pattern of master's guns at home so that I shouldn't wonder if there are 100 rubbles each. And in the butcher shops there are grouse and woodcocks and fish and hares but the shopmen don't say where they shoot them. Dear grandfather, when they have the Christmas tree at the big house, get me a gilt walnut and put it away in the green trunk. Ask the young lady Olga Ignatevena, say it's for Vanka. Vanka gave me a tremulous sigh and again started at the window. He remembered how his grandfather always went into the forest to get the Christmas tree for his master's family and took his grandson with him. It was a merry time. Grandfather made a noise in his throat. The forest crackled with the frost and looking at them Vanka chortled too. Before chopping down the Christmas tree, grandfather would smoke a pipe, slowly take a pinch of snuff and laugh at frozen Vanka. The young fir trees covered with hoar frost stood motionless waiting to see which of them was to die. Wherever one looked, a hare flew like an arrow over the snowdrifts. Grandfather could not refrain from shouting, hold him, hold him, hold him, ah the bobtail devil. When he had cut down the Christmas tree, grandfather used to drag it to the big house and there set to work to decorate it. The young lady, who was Vanka's favorite, Olga Ignatievena, was the busiest of all. When Vanka's mother, Palagea, was alive and a servant in the big house, Olga Ignatievena used to give him goodies and have nothing better to do. Told him to read and write, to count up to a hundred and even to dance a quadrille. When Palagea died, Vanka had been transferred to the servant's kitchen to be with his grandfather and from the kitchen to the shoemakers in Moscow. Do come, grandfather, Vanka went on with his letter. For Christ's sake, I beg you take me away. Have pity on an unhappy orphan like me. Here everyone knocks me about. I am fearfully hungry. I can't tell you what misery, what misery it is. I am always crying. And the other day, the, ma the master hit me on the head with a last so that I fell down. My life is wretched worse than any dog's. I send greetings to Alonia, one-eyed Yegorka, and the coachman, and don't give my concentrina to anyone. I remain your grandson, Ivan Zhukov. Dear grandfather, do come. Vanka folded the sheet of writing paper twice and put it into an envelope he had bought the day before for Kopec. After thinking a, a little, uh, he dipped the pen and wrote the address to grandfather in the village. Then he scratched his head, thought a little and added, Konstantin Makaric. Glad that he had not been prevented from writing, he put on his cap and, without putting on his little grey coat, ran out into the street as he was in his shirt. The shopman and the butchers, whom he had questioned the day before, told him that letters were put in post boxes and from the boxes were carried out all over the earth in mail carts with drunken drivers and ringing bells. Vanka ran into the nearest post box and thrust the precious letter in the split. An hour later, lulled by sweet hopes, he was sound asleep. He dreamed of the stove. On the stove was sitting his grandfather, swinging his bare legs and reading the letter to the cooks. By the stove was eel, wagging his tail. Hello. Today I have decided to read a short story because today is the world day of the book. Um, the short story that I've decided to read is The Ant and the Grasshopper by Aesop. 
uh, Aesop is uh, was a slave and storyteller believed to have lived in ancient Greece between 620 and 564 BC. Uh, so let's go right into it. One bright day in late autumn, a family of ants were bustling about in the warm sunshine, drying out the grain they stored up during the summer, when a starving grasshopper, his feet under his arm, came up and humbly begged for a bite to eat. What? cried the ants in surprise. Have a new store ending away for the winter? What in the world were you doing all last summer? I didn't have time to store up any food, whined the grasshopper. I was so busy making music that before I knew it, the summer was gone. The ants shrugged their shoulders in disgust. Making music, were you? They cried. Very well, now dance! And they turned their backs on the grasshopper and went on, t went, and went on with their work. The moral of the story is that there's a time for work and a time for play.